Thank you, Gary. And of course, NRDC couldn't do any of what we do without members like you. So that's the most important uh, message for today. And I would say for anybody, it would be terrible to follow those uh, film clips. It's nothing I can do will come close to that, but I'll, I'll give it a quick try. And, and it actually does relate because I think by now, many of us do actually have our personal stories of climate change. I'm from New York, so I think of Hurricane Sandy with the flooded homes and the subways, the power outages, the trees down. If you're in California, you think about the wildfires, you think about the drought, you think about mountains without snow. But now, we also have personal stories of climate change solutions. It may be that you drive a more efficient car. It may be that your company sources only renewable energy. Or maybe you walk to work or take bikes and save gas. For me, I think about the new insulation I put in our house, and every month we save bills and we reduce our carbon footprint. I'm the only one in our neighborhood who actually gets happy when the price of oil goes up because I know we're saving even more money. But as these personal stories come around, we ask, does it make any difference? And the answer is yes. Individual actions do make a difference in the aggregate. If and because of wise government policies, that create incentives, opportunities, and mandates so that these can really add up. And right now, though, these policies aren't coming from Washington. They're coming from California, here, where climate solutions are cutting carbon pollution and driving investments in clean energy. And many of you in this room have been instrumental in these efforts. Thank you. And they're coming from other states and local governments around the country. There are some are following California and some acting on their own. And in Washington, the solutions are coming from President Obama, who is moving fast to make sure we're not stymied by Congress's inability to act. Last summer, on a blistering hot day at Georgetown, the President unveiled his climate action plan. I was there. It was so hot that the President was in shirt sleeves, and the teleprompter broke partway through the speech. We heard later that the teleprompter broke because it was so hot quite an omen for a speech on global warming. The centerpiece of the President's speech was to go after climate pollution at some of its largest sources, power plants and transportation. But there's one significant piece of the climate pollution puzzle, both in the United States and globally, that's largely been under the radar. And that I want to call your attention to that today. And that's our food production system and our food use. Producing food is responsible for at least 15%, and some say perhaps up to 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And right now, we don't do much about it. So if we're gonna succeed in curbing climate pollution, we have to curb emissions from our food system as well as from our power system and our transportation system. It's a tremendous challenge, but as was said earlier, challenges are opportunities. And fortunately, many of the key measures that can reduce climate change pollution on farms also make farms more resilient to climate change. And many of these measures will also help farmers or households save money. Many will improve our health. So now's the time to start paying attention to our food system. But first, let me go back a moment to what we're already doing so we can see the momentum that our food work can play into. Here in California, of course, AB 32 is a shining example of what can be done when political leaders decide to act and stick with it. Many of you in this room have been key in implementing the plan, and as a result, California is on target to meet not only its 2020 target of reducing statewide emissions, but also moving forward to its mid-century goals. And in the Northeast, REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, has, helpful, has been helpful to reduce power plant emissions by 30% since its inception. I was, had the fun of being involved in the creation of REGI when I was working for New York State, and one of the things we insisted on was that the, all the uh, allowances be auctioned off instead of being given away for free. Paying for the allowances can help send an even stronger market signal about the cost of pollution, and of course create a fund for solutions such as ex energy efficiency and clean energy. And in REGI, that model has paid off. The 30% reduction in emissions has been accompanied by a 20% increase in regional pro domestic product. Now, many of you might have heard that Governor Christie, a couple years ago, tried to withdraw New Jersey from 
Reggie. That was a terrible step backwards, and he did it illegally. So we sued him. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that earlier this week, a New Jersey appellate court ruled in our favor and required that New Jersey has to reinstate regulations capping pollution from the power sector. Yeah, very good news. So between Reggie and California, we've already got 25% of American population living in states that are reducing carbon pollution through market mechanisms. That's a quarter of the country already on track, getting lower energy bills, cleaner air, and addressing climate change with stronger local economies. And these local efforts, by the way, have ripple effects even outside of those, those states. When New York City orders new subway cars, they're built in Lincoln, Nebraska. Glass workers in Ohio are building solar panels that go on roofs in New Jersey. I was a few years ago in Cleveland, and I met a woman named Lee Geis. She was a steel worker member who worked as a greaser on a machine shop floor. She was building titanium hubs for wind turbines. And because of that, she worked through the recession while many of her neighbors were laid off. So these policies, these clean energy policies, are not just climate change policies. They are much more than that to people. They are changing their lives. What's also impressive is how these policies are gaining momentum. NRDC and others are working to try to bring other states into the existing programs in California and New York. It's great that British Columbia is looking at joining Washington, California, and Oregon in the Pacific Coast Climate Action Plan. And even China, which takes a lot of its cues from California, has implemented or is beginning its first cap and trade program. So we've got a lot of momentum at the state and the local level. And now, when the federal government is beginning to step in, we can really make some progress, particularly with those power plant rules that were mentioned earlier. We know that power plants produce 40% of US carbon emissions. And right now, there are no national standards on how much carbon a power plant can produce. None, no limits at all. They have a free pass when it comes to carbon pollution. And for a lot of time, for recently, after the demise of the Waxman-Markey bill in Congress, we were stymied. What to do? We knew we could, at NRDC, that we could use the existing Clean Air Act, and EPA could act on that basis. But there was a strong perception in Washington that this approach wasn't going to be feasible, it was going to be too expensive, and wouldn't get us very far. So we set out to prove that position wrong. And we came up with an innovative strategy to cut power plant pollution. It seemed fair, it was flexible, and when we ran the numbers using the same analysts used by industry and by EPA, we found that it was going to be incredibly effective in cutting pollution and very cost effective. The blueprint started making its way around Washington. Here was a plan it seemed that the president could move on without having to wait for Congress. Here was a plan that could stand up to legal challenge. Here was a plan that would make sense politically, economically, and environmentally. So in his speech last summer, President Obama directed the EPA to put forth a proposal, which he'll do by June 1st, to cut pollution from existing power plants, and to do it in a way that sounded a lot like the NRDC proposal. The EPA is now going to release its proposal shortly. We don't know the details, of course, so we keep forging ahead and refining the analysis. According to our recent analysis, our latest analysis, which we updated and just released early last week, we can get even more carbon pollution than we previously estimated. We think we can reduce carbon emissions from existing power plants by up to 700 million tons each year by 2020. That's as much as 31% reduction from 2012 levels using cleaner energy sources, more renewable energy, some carbon capture and storage, and most importantly, energy efficiency. And that's on top of the 12% reduction 2012 from 2005 levels. And the framework we're proposing would set carbon limits for each state, taking into account differences in each state's fuel mixes. It would allow states and utilities to meet their goals in the most cost-effective manner, whether through cleaner fuels, increased efficiency, or more renewable energy. So instead of being required to retrofit or shut down existing plants, a utility would have the flexibility to shift generation from higher emitting to lower emitting sources, 
or it could earn credits by expanding efficiency programs, and generators could use those credits. Under this plan, the benefits for health and environment add up to anywhere between 28 and $63 billion each year by 2020. That's a cost-benefit ratio of at least 6 to 1 and perhaps as high as 15 to 1. That's a return on investment that Warren Buffett and even your Silicon Valley internet startup guys would love. We can actually produce and reduce energy bills for consumers and create tens of thousands of jobs while addressing climate pollution. Now, this isn't a done deal. We're expected to see the exact details of EPA's announcement in June. And following that proposal, we'll need to build support at the states to implement the plan. And we'll need to ensure that both law lawmakers at the local levels don't reactively tie up those measures with budgetary battles. And we'll have to make sure that Congress doesn't mess it up. But we have an incredible opportunity to eliminate a big chunk of our carbon pollution. And we're gearing up to make sure that we don't miss that opportunity. But we're going to need absolutely every person in this room and everyone else to make sure we get to the finish line. And let me quickly just touch on transportation, the second biggest source of pollution that we've already been dealing with. And of course, there again, the federal rule to limit, to put carbon limits on, on cars and therefore fuel efficiency standards followed from California, Senator Fran Pabli's bill that you passed in 2002. By, 25, by 2025, under the new federal standards, our cars will go twice as far on a gallon of gas and cut carbon pollution in half. This is expected to save consumers $1.7 trillion at the pump. And now we're expanding those standards to heavy-duty vehicles and others. And Cal it's not just vehicles. Oh, before we, but California is a hotbed of some of those clean vehicle technologies. Last year, I had a chance to test drive a delivery truck that used a hybrid retrofit system to reduce tailpipe emissions by over 90%. It's this type of new technology that can help lead the way to the future. And these are just part of the innovations. California's low carbon fuel standard is a strong policy to help drive the investment in cleaner fuels and are already cutting pollution and, de and diversifying the state's fuel mix. We've been trying hard to get other states in the Northwest and in the Northeast to join the low carbon fuel standards. And California is also leading the way in expanding transportation choices by offering more people to get out of their cars. Metro areas are dramatically increasing walking, biking, and public transit through SB 375. Of course, I think you all just want to be like us in New York City. And California is the first to start regulating the ride sharing services like sidecar and lift, which deliver which connect people who want to, the rides. These startups in the past have been operating in a bit of a nebulous legal area, but now that their legal standard has been clarified, there's a more solid footing to grow and to expand. So you see, we do have good momentum on power sector and transportation at the state and the federal levels. We need to keep going, though, and expand. And the best place to expand is into our food system. Now, in the food system, exact numbers are hard to come by because agriculture isn't required to report its emissions. Studies have put forth figures of agriculture being responsible for anywhere between 10 percent and perhaps up to 51 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. If you take out the outliers, that's maybe between a quarter and a third of world greenhouse gas emissions on the par of our transportation system, as you heard in the movie, and perhaps even more. That's a pretty big wedge to leave on the table. So where are these agricultural emissions coming from? Well, one of the biggest sources, again, as you saw in the movie, is the global loss of, of, of land conversion, clearing of forests and land for farming and livestock, which is a huge issue, actually, globally, but much less of an issue in the United States where forest land is coming back. Domestically in the United States, the major agricultural impacts are from nitrous oxides, which come from excess fertilizer, and methane, which comes from cows and manure. Both of these gases are far more pollute, powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So when you look at active agricultural emissions, not including land conversion, roughly about half is from meth methane and half is from nitrous oxide. But those, of course, are rough numbers. The question is, then, how do we reduce emissions 
while feeding 7 billion people. And of course, that 7 billion may soon become 9 billion, but that's a climate topic for another day. And this is where agriculture is really very different from power plants and transportation. We're talking about food, and that's a personal issue. Food is not just an input of calories, like power is about electrons and transportation is just getting goods or people from point A to point B. People like to eat what they want to eat. And that's one of the big challenges when it comes to addressing emissions from agriculture. But the upside of that challenge is that because it is personal choices, like, such as eating lower in the food chain, ordinary people, not just policymakers, have a powerful opportunity to transform our food system and play a role. Those personal stories of climate change solutions I talked about at the beginning can generate an even bigger impact regarding our food system. So how do we make some of these changes? Let me give you just a few quick thoughts. First, stop food waste. We've made great progress addressing carbon pollution through efficiency in the power sector and the transportation sector. We can do the same in the food sector. Globally, we waste about 40% of the food that we produce. It never gets eaten. The waste happens all along the path of production. Food rots in the field. It spoils during storage or transportation. It gets thrown out of grocery stores. It gets moldy in the back of your fridge. The global impact of producing food and not eating it, according to the FAO, is the equivalent of 3.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That makes wasted food alone a bigger source of greenhouse gas than any single country on the planet, with the exception of US or China. And in the United States, we have the same number. It's 40% of our food that is wasted. We, it is the largest component in our landfills where it turns into methane and is often the, one of the largest sources of methane through food waste. So what can we do about it? Turns out there's a lot of ways to be more efficient. One of the small things, for example, is looking at better date labeling system. Confusion over expiry dates has led, according to a recent survey, nine out of 10 people to be confused about whether their food is still good and to throw it away too early. How we use foods at home, how it's displayed in stores, how it's served in schools, for example, with trays or not, how it's collected at farms, all of these offer opportunities to cut food waste. Second, we can reduce over-fertilization. If fertilizer isn't being absorbed by the plant, it's not helping the plant, and it's not helping the farmer. It's a waste. Farmers spend time and money to apply it, and they don't get any benefit from it. But it's, this is that, that same fertilizer that's a waste is that volatilizes and pollutes. It becomes nitrous oxide, which is about 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Studies have shown, on the other hand, that producing the right amount of fertilizer at the right time can dramatically reduce nitrogen emissions by up to 25% or more. And that will also help farmers cut costs while they're addressing their greenhouse gas goals. NRDC is working with food industry leaders to be able to benchmark so farmers can compare themselves to others their nitrogen efficiency. This will give them a metric to think about how to move forward. And we're also working with buyers on a stewardship index to make sure their efficiency, their nitrogen, the farmer's nitrogen efficiency can count. Better soil management practices, like cover cropping, you know, planting cover crops for so to protect soil during the off season, can make farms more resilient to climate change, reduce the need for fertilizer, and increase soil carbon. Cover cropping is another win-win for agriculture and the environment. And yet currently, crop insurance systems actually create a disincentive for farmers to use cover crops. So we're trying to work with the insurance industry to be able to change that system so that the insurance industry is better off, farmers are better off, and our climate are better off. Third, we need to address, largely abroad but through our market forces, the issues of the drivers of deforestation and land conversion. And as you saw in the movie again, agricultural expansion is the major source of forest loss. Trees are being cleared to grow agricultural products such as beef and palm oil. That palm oil often ends up in consumer products, things like toothpaste and cookies. 
So under pressure from many of our NGO partners and us, some key partners or some key companies are starting to get it. Just last week, Colgate Palmolive agreed to go deforestation free in their products. And General Mills has a commitment to source palm oil, oil only from sources that aren't driving deforestation. Hopefully more will join this trend, but many companies still haven't fully gotten it. And my fourth and final suggestion for this morning is think about our meat diet. The production of beef primarily, but also pork and poultry, is a leading cause of environmental degradation as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Methane from ruminants, that's cows and lamb, uh, and manure is responsible for about half of U.S. agricultural emissions. And most of that is cattle. And just to be clear, that's cattle belching, not other things. And we can raise better beef. I met a ma rancher a while ago named Gabe Brown in North Dakota who won one of NRDC's Growing Green Awards in 2012. On his ranch, cattle are part of a holistic system in which plants and animals interact with the land and each other as they would na naturally. He grazes his cattle on an intense rotational system through native gra grangeland. The manure they deposit and the grasses are trampled into the soil where they release their nutrients into the soil, not into the sky, and, store car and can help store carbon. They can also there act as a natural sponge to hold more water, requ less, requiring less expensive irrigation. Food producers like him are demonstrating that running a sustainable, climate-friendly, and climate-resilient operation is a smart way to do business. So at NRDC, and we hope with others, we're trying hard to expand the incentives for farmers like that. And there's a powerful consumer angle here as well. Shifting diets to more sustainable meat, and less meat perhaps altogether, will dramatically reduce emissions in our food system. For example, chicken has perhaps only about 10% the greenhouse gas footprint of beef. My colleagues are working with some of the major food buyers, including restaurant and grocery chains, public school systems here in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and others, to incentivize sustainability in their supply chains. Efforts like this can improve the way we raise livestock and can begin to address emissions from agriculture. So in conclusion, we're starting to address climate change from multiple fronts. The EPA has a major opportunity to move forward this summer with carbon limits on existing power plants. Federal fuel efficiency standards and the low carbon fuel standards are going to make a big difference in the transportation sector as well as how we plan our communities. And critically, we need to pay attention to agriculture, where we have an unusual opportunity before us. It's a big wedge of the pie, and there are challenges to addressing it, but there are also tremendous opportunities. Now, we were told with transportation that Americans were in love with sprawl and their single family car and would never change. But here in California, you led the, sh the effort to show that, in fact, change can happen, and in fact, people will embrace change. We can do that with all sectors of our economy. So I would say to California, keep it up. Thank you.